Well, perhaps to, to title this message, it would just simply be that this, this is our journey through a passing world. The world as we know it is passing away. The book of Hebrews says we have here no lasting city. And so the Lord reminds us of these things today. I'd like to look at the gospel in kind of three stages and spend the most time in the middle stage. But the first stage is just there's a portrait of passing things. And if that's the case, then the Lord admonishes us about four basic things, four points of passage to promise things. And then finally, there's a prescription for for those of us who make our way through this passing world. So with that in mind, um, first of all, a portrait of passing things. You know, even before we get to the gospel, the time of year that we're in now is what we call in the northern hemisphere anyway, autumn, fall, autumn, and the, the leaves are falling, and in a way there's a kind of a dying that's going on. All the harvest is in, it's time to prune back the roses, and it's time to rake the leaves, and the trees will look all but dead for the next number of months. They're kind of going into a sleep. And um, this is an image for the passingness of things in this life, and our own. We come, all of us, through different stages in our life. We're born, there's a springtime a time of summer and growth, and then the autumn sets in, and then comes the winter of death. And so for all of us in this season, the the church bids us in November especially, especially in these last two weeks of November and the first two weeks of December when when the darkness is deepening and the autumn leaves are falling and being raked up and the first snow begins to come. We see that uh, the church bids us to reflect on what's called the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And uh, this is a time for us to simply, without great sadness, but just simply to accept the fact that there are stages in life that we go through, and there comes a time for all of us when we have to ponder the final things, the passing quality of this world and the final things to come, that one day we will die. And we must go to the judgment seat and render an account. So the church says, look at the seasons. At least here in the northern hemisphere, the seasons are very much in sync with the readings. So that's the first, if you will, portrait of passing things, just in the natural world around us. But we also see that the Lord gives a, a picture or a portrait of passing things here as well. There they were in Jerusalem, and they were admiring the temple. And the great temple there in Jerusalem was one of the marvels, one of the great sites of the, of the, of the ancient world. It was, um, it was just a magnificent building. It stood tall on a mountaintop, and it was made of white marble trimmed in gold. And when the sun would catch it, it gleamed and sent light out all through the valleys around Mount Zion. And there on that temple mount, the great temple stood. And what a magnificent marvel of the ancient world, engineering marvel. A magnificent, beautiful, beautiful building. And so they're admiring it. They say, Lord, look at this. This is great. And the Lord says, I warn you, there's a time coming when not one stone of this building will be left upon another. It will all be thrown down. And they're shocked. And they say, Lord, when? How? What will be the signs? I mean, how is it possible? This is God's temple. You're saying it could be destroyed? And the Lord is saying, yes, yes. And he he then goes on to give them some of the things. We'll get to that in a moment. But we see here that there is this magnificent temple. But remember, brothers and sisters, as beautiful as this church is, the church is not buildings. Jesus says, I'm the temple. I'm the temple, and you're members of my body. Together we're the temple of God, and it's not about a building. We build these beautiful buildings to remind us of heaven, as I said earlier. But at the end of the day... Jesus says, this, this ancient temple needs to go away now because I need you to understand it was pointing to me. But I am the temple of my body. I am the temple of God. And you and I as living stones in that edifice are also members of that great temple of God. And we don't worship on this mountain or that mountain, but in spirit and in truth. And so the Lord says, this building, not this building, but the ancient temple needs to go away. And I'll give you 40 biblical years to figure it out. But it's going to come down. And sure enough, exactly 40 years after the Lord said this, in 70 AD, it was April 7th, and the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem. 
And they set up a they, three and a half months. The city lay under siege. There was a terrible war that the Jewish people picked with the Romans, and it was a foolish war. And the Romans ruthlessly suppressed this Jewish uprising. And for three and a half years, that that war came all the way down from Galilee, and they worked their way to Jerusalem. And then. Jerusalem was surrounded by the armies. And Jesus had said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, don't go back in. Its doom is set. Get out. Get out while the getting is good. And so it is that Jerusalem was now surrounded. And the Romans casually set up a palisade, a a ramp. And when that ramp was finished, after three and a half months, on April 7th, they went over the hill, over over the wall, I should say, And they came into the city, and they laid it waste. 1.2 million Jewish people lost their lives in that war. That's a huge number. But Josephus gives us that number, and some modern historians like to doubt it, but they weren't there. He was. And in that three-and-a-half-year war, 1.2 million Jewish people lost their lives. It was a terrible, terrible war. Now the temple was destroyed. And so the Lord is prophesying something here that actually took place for them. That's why he said to them, there are some of you standing here that will not see death until they see all these things take place, namely the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem. Now, without getting into much more of the history of it, I just want you to see that for us now, this is the symbol that all things in this world are passing away. Glorious though the temple was, its time was over, and it was destroyed. You know, I just got back from Greece along with some of us, and raise your hand if you were on our trip. Wave at us, all right, at some of our pilgrims. We walked through some ruins, didn't we? And those ruins were once great cities, much like our own. Places like Corinth, places like Ephesus. These were magnificent cities, every bit as grand as Washington, D.C., Big, epic building, columns, Greek, Greek buildings, and magnificent areas, shopping, and the vanity fair of, of the ancient world. They even had indoor plumbing in some of the nicer homes, you know? We think we invented that stuff, right? And now they're all in ruins. And one day, this city, we're no different, we're no better. This city may one day lay in ruins. And 2,000 years from now, people will walk through the ruins of Washington, a once great city of a nation, the most powerful on the earth, now in ruins. I don't predict, I simply say that this is the pattern. We also visited Crete, the island of Crete. And on Crete was the great Minoan civilization some 2,000 years before Christ. They ruled the Mediterranean. They were brilliant They had magnificent culture. They were a powerful army as well, and a seafaring army. And and then all of a sudden, the island of Thera exploded. It was a volcanic caldera, and it blew up. And the Minoan civilization was swept away. And now, just ruins. We walk through the ruins of one of the great palaces of the Minoans. Gone now, swept away. And this is the nature of this world that, as the book of Hebrews puts it, we have here no lasting city. No lasting city. Nothing in this world abides forever. The Lord himself said elsewhere, he said, heaven and earth will pass away. Now, heaven doesn't mean there the heaven where God lives, but the the stars, the moon, the planet. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. And so the Lord says to us today, you need to be sober that what you call glorious, what you call wonderful, what you think, look at this, this is really something never before seen. I tell you, It will one day pass away. Do not continue to build your hopes on things that pass away, but rather on the things that are eternal. My word, my promises to you, stand on these promises and set your eyes on the heavenly Jerusalem that will never pass away. But do not put your trust in sand, which too easily is swept away. And so we see that um, you're... We could, some of us will go to the Holy Land, hopefully, in a couple of years. And there, too, how many of these ruined cities? Jesus said, you, Bethsaida, you, Capernaum, you, uh, uh, Chorazin, are you to last forever? No, I tell you, you'll be swept away. For your fate, if the wonders worked in you had been worked in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But as it is, he predicted their ruin, and now you walk through the ruins of Capernaum. I've walked through the ruins of Chorazin and Bethsaida. 
have walked through those ruins. And this is the nature of things in this life. We think, oh, here's something. Look at this. This will last. And then we pass by again, and it's strangely gone. Well, I simply say all these things to you to repeat what the Lord is saying, that we have to remember that we have to have a kind of a sobriety about this world. So I won't spend much more time on it, but there is a portrait, a picture here of the passing quality of this world. We see it in the autumn leaves falling. We see it in the destruction of the temple. Those of us who were pilgrims saw it in these ancient, once glorious cities, now in ruins. Some of them because of earthquakes. Some of them because of volcanoes. Some of them simply because the river silted out and the city went bankrupt and it was abandoned. But nothing here, no glory in this world lasts. So don't be too impressed by it all. That's the first thing that the Lord teaches us. Now, we move on, though. If that's the case, you and I do have to make a passage through this world that's passing away. We're assigned to live here for a certain period, not being too impressed with its glories, not being disdainful. God does give us beautiful things, and there are things, organizations, buildings, things to respect and honor, but at the end of the day, it's all going to pass away. So if that's the case, then how shall we conduct ourselves on this passage that we make through a passing world. And the Lord gives us four basic things to keep before us. He says to beware of false messiahs. He tells us that we live in a time of fierce militarism. He he tells us of far-flung marvels and of fearful malice. Let's look at each of them. But they're things for us to be aware of, to be sober about, to accept, even if they're hard, to accept them as just part of the way it is in this world currently now where we are, even as we look to a world that will never pass away, where there is beauty and justice and love. So the first thing is he tells us, as you make your journey through this passing world, first of all, beware of false messiahs. He says here, do not be deceived. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time has come. Do not follow them. Do not be deceived by false messiahs. Now, the word here, Messiah, means for us, for our purposes, Savior. And we see that too many people would say, what is a false messiah? A false messiah is anything or anyone other than Jesus Christ who we think can either save us or help us in a profound way. Anything other than Jesus Christ or anyone other than Jesus Christ that's telling us how to order our lives and secure our safety and salvation. Beware of false messiahs. And they come in many, many ways. Again, too many people, though, including us Christians, give too much authority in our life to people and to worldly things. We give more attention and authority in them than we do to Jesus Christ. Too easily we simply follow the dictates of modern culture. We get all mesmerized by it, and we start singing its songs, and we start to say, you know, these words don't seem to sound like the gospel, but we go on singing them anyway, and we dance to them. We watch things we have no business watching, things that corrupt our values. We, we get involved very often, and we put our loyalties in politics more than we have. We have more loyalty to politics than to the faith, to the teachings of Jesus. This is how we can be if we're not careful. So the politicians or the economists or leaders of popular culture come to us and say, look, I will give you meaning. I will give you purpose. I'll make a way for you. I'll grant you money and power and access. I'll do all these things for you. Just give me your loyalty. Never mind that some of these things have teachings and values and approaches to life that are completely contrary to the teachings of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's our Messiah. Beware of false messiahs. Now, I don't tell you not to get involved with politics or never listen to a popular song or never go to a movie. I simply say to you, have your gospel glasses on. And if you see something that's not the gospel, see it for what it is. It is not the gospel. Reject it. Have nothing to do with these types of thinking. There's tremendous problems that we have in the world today. Because too many of us Christians just go along with whatever is popular. But remember, what is popular is not always right. And what is right is not always popular. And too often, though, we just go downstream with culture, with politics, with 
whatever seems expedient for our career, and we'll do that and blithely just set aside Jesus as if money or power or worldly popularity would somehow save me and keep me safe. I promise you, whatever is popular today is passing away. You know, we all agreed on what was the marriage until about 20 minutes ago in our culture. And now there's all kinds of confusion, even about what's male and female. There's grave confusion today. Brothers and sisters, we've got to stay with Jesus. Male and female, he made us. A marriage is a man, one man for one woman, till death do us part, bearing fruit and children. These are the teachings. Culture comes and goes. In the age of the church, empires have risen and fallen, nations have come and gone, heresies and confusion and popular trends have come and gone, and here we still are preaching the gospel. If that is not proof to you that his word remains, well, things come and go, there it is. And we have to stay with the teachings of Jesus. These are the things that save us. These are the things that make for holiness, for happiness, and for ultimate salvation if we will base our lives on His teachings, not on the passing trends of popular culture. Now, that not everything is evil. I simply ask you as I ask myself, judge everything by the gospel. But too many people have it backwards. Well, the gospel, that's hard. That's difficult. That's like old-fashioned. You see, you got it backwards if you're doing that. We judge the culture. We judge the world by the standards of the gospel. We do not judge the gospel by the standards of the world, which is passing away. And that's simply all I ask. I don't tell you to never listen to a popular song. I just ask you, be sober. What's it really saying? Is it the gospel? It might be. It might be a song about love and loyalty. It might be a beautiful thing. There are good movies. There are good things. Support them. But judge everything, as St. Paul says. Put everything on trial by the gospel. And let the gospel, Jesus is our Messiah. He is our Savior. So beware, he says, first of all, as you make your journey through this passing world, beware of false messiahs. Do not let anyone or anything else other than Jesus organize your life and speak the truth to you. And everything else comes down to what he has said, what he has done, and what he teaches through his scriptures and the church. Now then we come to the next thing he says, that uh, not only should we beware of false messiahs, but we need to understand that we are at war. We're at war. He says here, you will hear of wars and insurrections. Don't be terrified. Such things happen. Hmm? Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. These things happen. Now, rather than focus on worldly wars where we're thinking about tanks and missiles and burnt planes and Let's go to the spiritual combat, spiritual war. Brothers and sisters, we are at war. Everywhere around us, demons and angels are fighting for influence in our life. There's a great cosmic battle that goes on. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall from the sky like a lightning. The book of Daniel talks about how Michael the archangel is waging war against the devil and his demons. There's a war going on at the cosmic levels, and you and I are caught up in that war. It starts right in our very heart, where there's a war going on between what is good and noble and beautiful and true and what is base and sinful and ugly. And we have decisions to make every day. We're caught up in this war, this conflict between good and evil. It's in our very heart. Likewise, we're caught up in this war because people you know and love are being picked off by Satan, picked off by him. Do you care about that? Do I? You see, part of the problem, I think, for a lot of us in the, in the world today, a lot of Christians in the world today, is that we've kind of lost our sense that we're in a battle. We just say, oh, well, it'll all be happy in the end. That's in movies, y'all. That is not real life. You heard today in the first reading There's a day of judgment coming, and the wicked are going to be stubble. Now, there's more to wickedness than just being a genocidal maniac. There are other forms of wickedness. But we we prefer sin to the kingdom of God, and God will not force anyone to love what he loves. There is a battle for your heart, for your loyalty. Do you want what God is offering or not? Do you want chastity? Do you want sobriety? Do you want forgiveness and mercy and forgiving your enemy and loving your enemy or not. These are the decisions that we make every day and we form our heart. And not just us, but people you know and love 
performing their heart. And there will come a day of reckoning when God will simply say, here's what I'm offering. Do you want it or not? And it's just foolish to think that we're going to just all of a sudden start loving what we've hated all our life. I don't love, you know, people walk around, I want chastity. I don't want to love my enemy. I want to kill my enemy. And you've heard me on this. It is just foolish to think that we're suddenly going to look and see the kingdom of heaven and suddenly want it. So you see, there's a battle going on every day in your heart and your mind about good and evil, about what is right and beautiful and true, or what is base, ignoble, and destructive. And not just you, but people you know and love, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren. And so we need to engage the battle First of all, for our own heart. Lord, help me to love you and to love what you're offering. I I love sin too much. I love things that are not you too much. Change my heart. Help me to love sobriety. Help me to love chastity. Help me to love my neighbor. Help me to love goodness and truth and beauty and virtue and not the other terrible things that too easily I love and embrace. I'm at war, Lord. Help me. Help me, Lord to overcome the battle, the battle for my heart. And likewise, Lord, help my spouse, help my children, my grandchildren, and help me to help them. Help me to say a word that will convict them and help them to know they have decisions to make. And that at the end, it does matter. The daily decisions that I make really do accumulate, and they, they move me in a certain direction. Help me to know that, Lord. Help me to be aware of it, because you see, brothers and sisters, we're at war. And we don't act that way enough. And so it is that we have to learn the strategies of the evil one and see his incursions and what he's doing in our life. And we need to see what the Lord has to offer us as an antidote to that. We need to see the deep roots of sin in our life and the life of people we know and love and help them to combat them with the virtues. This is what it means to be at war. St. Paul gives this very good reminder to us He says, um, this is from, you've heard this before, it's just a very well-known passage from Ephesians chapter 6. But the basic premise is, we are at war. Therefore, he says, stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the gospel of peace. And besides all these, take up the shield of faith with which you can quench the flaming darts of the enemy. And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So protect yourself. Protect yourself again with the shield of faith. And take up the sword and engage the battle for your heart and for the heart and soul of people you know and love. This should not just belong to priests in pulpits. It belongs to parents, to fathers, to mothers. It belongs to grandparents. It's the battle that we all fight for our own heart, our own soul, and the souls of people we love. Engage the battle. All right. So we see that in this journey through a passing world, the Lord says, first of all, you be careful about false messiahs. You be careful about people who come making promises that you'll be happy and content if you do something different than what I told you. You be careful about that. Do not be deceived. Do not follow them. Likewise, realize that you're at war. Fierce militarism. Now we come next to these far-flung marvels. In our life, there will also be, he says here, powerful earthquakes, famines, plagues, awesome sights, and mighty signs in the skies and the heavens. Now, again, let's not simply look at, there's always been earthquakes. Maybe there's a comet that appears, signs in the heavens, people take its portents, and okay. But let's move beyond just the physical aspect of an earthquake or some sign in the heavens. You see, these things are a symbol to us of spiritual realities. You see, what is it, in this sense, what are the earthquakes in our life? Is anything that shakes the ground on which we feel comfortable and stand on? Now, again, we see here that uh, in our life there are just some things that rock our world, so to speak. And the Lord says you have to accept the fact that as you make your journey through this world that is passing away, that things shake and move under your feet, that that things happen that will rock your world. And it could be just simple, ordinary things. But but let's, let's, let's ponder what most of us kind of depend on, what we stand on. We certainly stand on the Lord, but I think we also stand on things like we need money. 
We, uh, we need friends and family. We, we, we need our own skills, our own strengths. And we, to some degree, we, these are like a foundation for us. But even these rock and shake. I mean, the most obvious example that I could give you in my own life is the sudden death of my sister who died in a fire or my mother who died in a snowstorm. Suddenly, the phone rang and they're gone. They pick up the phone. Hey, what's, what's going on? She's gone. Gone, swept away. You know, to look into that casket and see my mother who gave me birth, who changed my stinking diapers and wiped my snotty nose, to see her lying there, lifeless. That's an earthquake. That rocks your world. And to, to sit in my father's room as he lay dying, and, it, and he was gone. This giant in my life, who taught me, who who was a hero to me in so many ways, and yet someone I also struggled with, but he was a mighty force in my life, and he breathed his last. That rocked my world. Likewise, we have other earthquakes in our life. Maybe the loss of a job. Maybe some sudden change in our life. Or medical diagnosis. We think we're standing tall and got it all going on and all of a sudden we have a stroke or we get lost and we get a, a, a bad medical report and suddenly we're fighting cancer. Our whole world is rocked. So the Lord says earthquakes like this happen in your life. You are journeying through a world that is passing away. And this is part of this just something to be sober about. Don't run around fearful, but these things inevitably happen for all of us. And you know, again, we... <laughs> We think that we're standing tall, even just our own, our very self. You know, I, I used to think, like, these two lights are burnt out right here, you see. Now, when I first came here 25, 27 years ago, I was a younger man. I'd throw the ladder up with my own strength, climb up there. Now I fear heights, and I'm not strong enough to bring the ladder out myself. You better, you better fear heights, Father. Don't go climbing up on those, those ladders, right? But I never thought twice. You know, it's funny. A funny story about me is um, I, 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 I spent about four years uh, as a summer job in college building and servicing pipe organs. Imagine, what a, what a crazy job, right? But they hired me because I was so thin. They said, we need, some, we need you because you're thin. You can get inside these organ chambers and you can tune the pipes and get between these little narrow passages and, you know. See, I, so I, I was kind of kid with you. I, I kind of joan on myself. I say, I used to be young, tan, and trim, and now I'm old, white, and fat. <laughs> you know? But this is what happens. This is what happens in our life, you see. Things begin, our health begins to decline, and hair starts to go away, and <laughs> things start to fall off and stop working. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is part of our journey. It rocks your world, you know? Most of us adjust gen- gently to it, but there can be times in our life when suddenly our, our health is just different. And we no longer get over injuries quickly. And this is part of our journey in this life. And the Lord simply says, I just want you to be sober about this. That in this world, you're going to often, this is a passing world, but you're going to be confronted by false messiahs. Do not be deceived by them. Listen to me. You're going to encounter the fact that you're at war. Fierce militarism. You're also going to discover that many Things rock your world, far-flung marvels, earthquakes, signs in the heavens, portents, all these things that unsettle you, but don't let it unsettle you. I'm with you. I'm with you in this passage through a passing world. I just want you to be sober about these things, not be unnerved by them. Things happen that rock your world because this isn't your world. It's passing away. Now, finally, the Lord offers a fourth area that we should be aware of. Fearful malice. He simply says, look, they're going to seize you and they're going to persecute you. They're going to hand you over to the synagogue leaders and put you in prison and they'll have you led before kings and governors because of my name. What the Lord is saying here is, look, persecution is the normal Christian experience. If you're going to live as a Christian in this world, expect to be persecuted. Expect to suffer for the truth. Now, In our country, this has been less obvious uh, over the many years, but it's getting increasingly dark in our culture. And as it gets darker and darker, we're going to suffer more. When you start to stand up for right, you start to stand up 
for the biblical definition of marriage. You start to stand up for life beginning at conception through natural death, and you resist these very popular trends. You're going, we're going to increasingly be summoned into court. You know, I don't know if you read, but the little sisters of the poor are back in court again. Back in, come on, crazy. Go pick on somebody your own size. Because they won't offer contraceptive coverage. It will bring them back to court again and again until they're bankrupt, you see. Wear them down. Or bake me a cake, you bigot. All these kinds of things. These things are going to increasingly come upon us if we try to stand up for the biblical values that have always been taught. That we, for the most part, agreed to as a culture 25 minutes ago. And all these things have happened very quickly. And so I simply say to you that if you stand up and speak the truth about these things, you will suffer. And and that suffering is going to get increasingly difficult. It's not like the people in Nigeria who suffer church bombings every weekend, or places like Kenya, or places in Africa, Sudan, and so on, where the church is growing wonderfully, but it's also suffering, great martyrdom. It's a growing church, but a suffering church. It's not like that for us yet, but it could get that way. So I simply say to you, the normal Christian life is to experience persecution if we are living and speaking the truth to a world that is often unwilling to hear it. So this is these four things that the Lord tells us as we make our journey through this passing world. Beware of false messiahs. Be aware of fierce militarism, that you're in a war. Be aware of these marvels that shake your world as part of life in this world. And be aware, too, that you will suffer. You will be persecuted. Do not be unsettled by these things. I told you these things ahead of time so that when they happen, says the Lord, you will not lose heart. And that leads to the very final aspect of the, what the Lord says, the prescription. Simply this, by your perseverance, you will secure your lives. Persevere. You see, there's, there's just so, we, 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 Jesus says elsewhere, he says, whoever endures to the end will be saved. Or again, we read in Scripture, my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul will have no pleasure in him. But brothers, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are those who have faith and keep their souls unto eternal life. Hebrews chapter 10. So again, we're called to persevere, and old spiritual just says, hold on, just a little while longer. Everything is going to be all right. The Lord says, look, the cross is inevitable in this life, this passing world. But you look beyond that cross and see the heavenly Jerusalem in all of its glory, where there's no more moaning or groaning, no more sighing and no more dying, no more farewells, but just forever to being caught up in the love of God and one another. That world is where we're heading, but that is not this world. And the Lord says, be sober about it. You're making a passage through a passing world. The autumn leaves tell you this. The destruction of the temple tells you this. Those ruined cities we walk through tells us this. Common sense tells us these things. But I tell you, says the Lord, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. So here in the age of the church, nations have come and gone, empires have risen and fallen, but here we still are preaching the same gospel. Let that be proof to you that the gospel endures even as great powerful empires come and go. The gospel endures because it's the word of God. Well, I want to finish by just quoting the words of an old song. I often quoted at funerals, and this is not a funeral, but we did deal with some funereal concepts, yes? (laughs) And it's it's beautiful advice, beautiful old hymn of the church, and um, it is um, simply this. Time is filled with swift transition, and naught of earth unmoved can stand. So build your hopes on things eternal, and hold to God's unchanging hand. Another verse says, covet not this world's vain riches that so rapidly decay. Seek to gain the heavenly treasures, they will never pass away. And yet one more verse says, when your journey is completed, if to God you have been true, Fair and bright, the home and glory your enraptured soul will view. Oh, hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. This is our prescription and our passage through a passing world. Amen.
So today is the feast of the baptism of the Lord. The baptism of the Lord. And um, at first stance, we see that John, the Baptist, is quite puzzled. Why should I baptize you? I should be baptized by you. You know, you're, you're the Holy One. I mean, why do you need to be baptized, right? What does baptism do for us? Mm-hmm. Either one, yeah? Either one. It gives us the Holy Spirit. Before that, it does that, though. What does it do also? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. It washes away all your sins and it gives you the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, Jesus already has the Holy Spirit and he doesn't have any sins. Amen. In fact, let me read you a couple of scriptures that say this, that um, we have a high priest, says the book of Hebrews, who can sympathize with our weakness. He was tempted in every way we are, yet he never sinned. Mm. And likewise, um, in the first letter of John, it says that, you know how the Lord appeared to take away sins but in him there is no sin. And so John is kind of scratching his head saying, why should I baptize you? Baptism is about sin. You don't have sin. Amen? So John is puzzled, and some of us might be puzzled. Right? So there's a couple of thoughts here that we want to talk about. But the main thing I want you to think about, and brothers and sisters... There is, I want to talk about three aspects of baptism today. There's a fraternity of baptism. There are indeed, the, there's a fulfillment of baptism. And there are four gifts that come to us in baptism. But let's look at it. First of all, there is the fraternity. There is this magnificent truth, brothers and sisters. That it says it, and it, says it in the scriptures, in the book of Hebrews. Jesus is not afraid to call us his brethren. He's not ashamed or afraid to call us his brethren. Now, I'm going to just say, y'all, I would be. <laughs> y'all, we got some nuts falling out of our family tree. Amen? You say, hey, I don't know them. I don't know anything about them, you know? I see the Lord walking off. I, uh-uh, they ain't mine. I'm not related to them, right? But he does. It's remarkable. He has this love for us. Jesus identifies with sinners. In fact, so much so that the scribes and the Pharisees of his time said, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. I mean, that's like, somebody say, bad company. (laughs) Bad company. I'm showing my age again, sorry, sorry. (laughs) Bad company. You know, let's be honest about it. It's kind of embarrassing to be associated with some of us, right? Amen? Now, don't lose your sense of your own dignity. But you understand, the human family is kind of dysfunctional. And yet Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brother. You're, you're rabbi, these, these scribes and Pharisees said, welcome sinners and even eats with them. Now for us, you know, eating a meal is like, well, who, you know. But for, for the ancient world, eating a meal, is, you're my brothers, you're my sisters. It's about intimacy. In fact, most of the words that we have for, um, for example, the German word for, for bread is brot. Mm-hmm. And we, it's also related to the word for brot, you know, bruter, brothers. Who are my brothers? The ones I eat bread with. Another word for bread is pan, right? Who are my companions? Those that I eat bread with. Companions and companionship and accompanying. All these words, you hear the word pan in there. Bread is not just a meal. Bread is a symbol of intimacy It's a family. It's those that I keep close company with. So the Pharisees and the scribes says, man, your rabbi doesn't just welcome sinners. He even eats with them. He even eats with them. He keeps, he breaks bread with them. He calls them his brothers, his sisters. Now let's really up the ante. Look behind me. What's behind me? What's up there? Huh? The cross. Yeah. Jesus Christ, who never sinned, was crucified between two thieves. 
And he was crucified in the kind of a death that most says, this isn't just any sinner. This is like the worst of sinners. The Jewish people and the Romans reserved crucifixion for the worst of sinners. Look at him up there. The Jewish people said anybody who's hung from a tree is obviously a sinner and not blessed by God. And the Romans said, hey, we've got that down to a science. We'll hang you from a tree all right. And they reserved that punishment for the worst of sinners. Do you understand how Jesus has none of this ego stuff that some of us have? i gotta have, I got to have my reputation. People need to think I'm just great. People, yeah, Jesus doesn't worry about any of that. All he worries about is you, me. Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren. He's not ashamed, even though he never sinned, he is not ashamed to be identified with sinners and to love them. So before we even look at baptism today, I want somebody to say, thank you, Jesus. You've been awfully good to me. You, you, you shed all of your glory. You shed all of your honors. And you came among us. There's a beautiful hymn from the Philippians, the letter to the Philippians, that just simply says this. Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not deem equality with God something to cling to, but rather he emptied himself. And he took up the form of a slave. And he was known to be of human estate, and it was thus that he humbled himself, obediently accepting even death, death on a cross. Now listen, pay attention. Because of this, God the Father highly exalted him. And he bestowed upon him a name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. In the heavens, on the earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah. Even the demons have to bend the knee at the name of Jesus, and they got to confess that Jesus is Lord. They can't help it. They just have to. All right? Amen? Now listen. But you see, first what came, before all that exaltation, first the humility. Do you see how much the Lord loves you? Young people, do you see this? Don't you ever forget that somebody loves you so much that he shed all of his glory. He was identified with the worst of sinners, even though he never sinned. He, 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 he overthrew his reputation, everything about him, and he suffered and died on a lonely hillside with two thieves for you. Are you praying with me? So that's the first thing we want to see, that there's a fraternity that the Lord shows us in our baptism. He joins our family. We are baptized into his body, the church. He's not ashamed. I would be, but he's not, right? All the nuts falling out of our family tree, it doesn't matter to him. He just says, I want you to know how much I love you. Never forget that I overlooked all of that. Whatever foolishness and stupidness we've all done in life, the Lord says, I, I already knew that before I made you. I already knew all that. Don't make light of it. It's a sin. Get to confession. I want to work with you. But at the end of the day, don't worry that you have to earn my love for you. You've got that. Before I ever formed you in your mother's womb, I knew all about you. It's all about you. And still, still, even still, all right. Now, we see the fraternity of baptism. Let's take a, take a look next at the fulfillment of baptism. Jesus says something to John. He says, look, he says, um, let it be for now. Let it be. John, Jesus said to John, when John says, why, why should I be baptized by you? You know, I, I mean, why should I baptize you? I should be bap, you know, baptized by you. Why, you're not sinful. What, what's going on here? And Jesus says, Shh, John, let it be for now to fulfill all righteousness. And so John let him, and he baptized him. Now, with all that in mind, Jesus humbly goes down into these waters of baptism, identifying himself with sinners, but he also says, I want to fulfill all righteousness. Now, there's a lot of different opinions about what that means, but let me just bring you to a guy, a real guy with a fancy name here. His name is uh, Maximus of Turin. Somebody say Maximus. That means big guy. 
Maximus, right? Maximus, big guy of Turin. Somebody say big guy of Turin. Have you ever heard of the Shroud of Turin, right? Same town, same place. A guy named, uh, one of the early church fathers was named Maximus. And he comments on it this way. I'm going to read a quote from him, then I want to develop it with you. Did you remember, he says, Maximus, remember in the book of Exodus, how there was the, 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 the Red Sea, and God parted the Red Sea. But he didn't just say, go on through there. He says, he led them through in the column of fire during the night and the column of, of, of cloud during the day. So God went on ahead of them. Now, young people, how, do, how tall do you think these walls are up to the ceiling? How, what, do you, what do you think? 50 feet? You're a little exaggerating, but you're close. Okay? 28. You're very close. 30 feet up to the top there, right? Amen? All right. Now, according to the Bible, when God parted the waters, they were 30 feet high on this side and 30 feet high on that side. Now, let me ask you a question, y'all. God says, go on through now. <laughs> Somebody say, will it hold? <laughs> you got to trust. You got to have faith, right? Amen? Now, God didn't just say, go on through. He says, I'll tell you what. Let me lead you through. And in the pillar of cloud and pillar of fire, God walked on through with the waters parted on either side. And the Lord said, I'm not asking you to do something I won't do myself. I'm asking you to follow me. I will be with you, says the Lord. Amen? Amen. Jesus doesn't say, you carry a cross. He says, I'll tell you what, I'll carry the cross first, and you follow me. Amen? All right. So what Maximus says is that just as the Lord went through those waters in the book of Exodus and brought them, it's a symbol of baptism, right? Right? On one side, they're slaves. On the other side, they're free. On one side, they're, they're troubled. On the other side, they're set free. So that's a symbol of baptism. Amen? The Lord says, come on through. Come on through these waters. Wade in the water. Amen? All right? Do not be afraid. So, it's, it's, so Maximus goes on. He says here, therefore, just as that was done... In the ancient times, he says, now Christ goes through the waters of Jordan in the column or the pillar of the body. He goes into those waters, both to part those waters for us and to make them holy. We get made holy by the waters of baptism, but Jesus made the water holy. Amen? All right. That's, that's a big difference. And so Maximus says to us that not only is there a, 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 a fellowship of baptism. The Lord joins our broken down dysfunctional family. But there's also a kind of a fulfillment. He simply says, John, let it be so, so that I can fulfill what I once did in the ancient world with the waters and I went through and I led the people through. I need to lead them now in baptism. I need to make these waters holy. I need to show them the way. And I will not exempt myself. I will identify with them who are sinners, even though I never sinned. And I will go through those waters to show them this is the way. Walk in it. Amen? All right. So the Lord goes into the waters. But get this now. He goes into those waters. And he brings us back some gifts. He brings us back four gifts. Four of them. I'll list them for you and then we'll look at them, okay? You say, Father, haven't you memorized them? Why do you have notes? To spare you my forgetfulness. There are four gifts here. Access, anointing, acknowledgement, and approval. Now, first of all, access. It says that when Jesus went into those waters, it says the heavens were open. I'm looking for some people jumping up on their pews and say, Hallelujah, Father. Hallelujah. The heavens were open. I'm looking. I, don't, I still don't see it. Well, Father, we're a little too cool for school. All right. Do you understand, my brothers and sisters, the heavens were opened. The heavens were opened. Somebody just say, Hallelujah. 
You know, we got cast out of a, an earthly garden, an earthly paradise. It was called Eden, right? And God said, well, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll let you back in. No. That is not what God did. God said, hey, maximum promotion. Maximum promotion. I'm not just going to let you back into some earthly garden I had for you. That was just a symbol of something better I wanted to offer you. I'm going to let you in to the heavenly paradise, the heavenly Eden, the heavenly holy of holies. Yeah. God says, I'm up in the ante, all right? You said, what's an ante? I don't know. I don't know. I just, God is saying, listen, it's not enough for me to restore you. I want to raise you up to something even greater. Church, the heavens were opened. Now, what is heaven? Is it just a place? No. Heaven is far greater than that. Listen. And we're going to talk about this in the third point, but let's just start it here. Heaven is the heart of the Father. Jesus gave us access. Our first gift. Jesus gave us access to the very heart of his Father. You want to know what heaven is? It's to be in the heart of the Father. To have this beautiful love for the Father. You know, sometimes, sometimes, we get distant from father figures. Not all of us have had perfect earthly fathers. In fact, let's just say it plain. None of us have had perfect earthly fathers. But there's something deep and beautiful. We long for the father's love. God made you for himself. Yes, he made you. He made you for this. Our hearts are restless, so they rest in you, Lord. You know, I want to say something, and I, I don't want to get too personal, but I want to just say that, you know, I, I, like anybody else here, I struggled with my earthly father, Charles Pope Sr. You know, a good man, a great man. He, I never missed a meal. He was good to me. He took care of me, and when I was in trouble, he'd come to my rescue. I remember the first car accident I ever had. <laughs> my dad was there for me. I thought he was going to yell at me. He said, no, 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 I hope you totaled it so we can get a new car. <laughs> But listen, I had my struggles with my father like any... It's more my fault than his. But you know, something very beautiful happened. In the last six months of my father's life, he was dying, and I sat at his deathbed for many, many hours. In fact, it was when I first came here, 12, maybe a little more than 12 years ago. It was July of 2007, I think it was. And I had just come here, but... I I spent a lot of time sitting at my father's deathbed. And he and I had, quote, the talk. And he told me, son, what I was longing to hear. I love you, and I'm proud of you. I'm glad you're a priest, and you've done well. I don't know, especially maybe those of us who are men, we know how much we long to hear that from our fathers, especially men. Women too, but at the end of the day, something very precious. And I know that what it did for me is it really opened my heart to the Heavenly Father too. Just this beautiful healing word that I have access to the heart of the Father. The final gift my own earthly father gave me was to know that I was loved and appreciated. Maybe we should have had the talk earlier. Whatever. We didn't. But we had it. And that opened up a beautiful relationship I have with the Heavenly Father now. He's been good to me. And I have this tender affection for the Heavenly Father. He's been so good to me. God has been so very, very good to me. And I'm, I'm open now with this sense of gratitude and wonder and awe. That beautiful word that St. Paul says and Jesus himself uses, Abba, Abba. You could teach a parrot to say the word. It's not the word, it's the experience. You're my father. You've been good to me. And I love you. And I appreciate your love. and your, your, your... That's heaven, y'all. I'm not there yet, but I'm already experiencing some of it. I love the father. I love him. He's been good to me. I can't say I was always there. 
There was times when I was more fearful of the Heavenly Father. But run to Mother Mary, she can get me out of trouble because the Father's coming after me. That was my earthly stuff, y'all. God the Father loves you. He created you, and he wants that intimate relationship with you. I don't know if you noticed, but Jesus was crazy about his Father. Talked to him all the time. Talked about him all the time. And he said, Abba, Abba, I want you to love my Father like I love my Father. He's been, you know, so there's this tender, beautiful gift. The first gift, then, of baptism is access. Not just, it says the heavens were opened, but listen, heaven is to be in the heart of the Trinity, and particularly the heart of the Father. And Jesus goes into those waters to give you access to the Heavenly Father. Amen? Amen. That's the first gift. I won't spend as much time on all of them, I promise. But there comes not just access, but anointing. It says, not only were the heavens open, but the Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dove. <gasps> now listen, y'all. Let's get excited for a minute. Just for a minute. The Holy Spirit, He is the third person of the Trinity, but He's the wisdom of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the joy of God, the, the, the beauty of God, the magnificence of God. Every good and perfect thing. Oh, the Holy Spirit, what an anointing to come alive with not just human spirit and human life, but godly spirit and godly life. Oh, y'all, don't ever underestimate the beautiful, wonderful, glorious gift of the Holy Spirit. Go back with me to that upper room. And those were some frightened people, 120 and all, all huddled up. All huddled up. And we're scared, man. He told us to go to the nations. We don't know what we're supposed to do, man. We're scared. We're frightened. Those Jewish people killed our Lord. And, you know, we're Jews, but they killed our... I'm frightened. I'm scared. The doors are locked. Holy Spirit came. Holy Spirit came. Whew. And they were all filled with the Spirit. And what's the first experience? Joy and confidence. It says they started speaking of the great works of God. And the doors came open and Peter went out and preached a barn burner of a sermon. 3,000 people were added to their number that day. And that's a sermon. You know. Somebody once said, uh, and we, we preachers always say this in humility. You know, Peter preached a, a sermon and got three, one sermon and preached, got 3,000 converts. I have preached 3,000 sermons. I got no one convert, not one. <laughs> Listen, I hope it's a little more than zero. All right. But anyway, you get the idea. Look, do you see what the Spirit can do? If you're fearful, He'll give you confidence. If you're starved, He'll give you joy. If you're struggling, He'll show you a way. If, if you have... Expect great things from your relationship. Jesus went into those waters to bring us access to His heart, the Father's heart, Access to heaven, which is what heaven is, the, the heart of the Father. He gave, he came, he also came to get you the Holy Spirit. Now we go on to this acknowledgement. He says simply to all of the people there that day, this is my beloved son. Listen to that. When you went into the waters of your baptism, God opened up the Father's heart to you. He gave you the Holy Spirit who dwells in you like a temple. And then he said to you and to everybody standing by, you're my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. Stop all this running around trying to please people. You are not great because you have money or power or wealth or your good looks or your big hair. None of that. None of that is the source of your dignity. Your dignity, your worth, your glory comes down to simply this. You, I'm not talking to the person next to you now. I'm talking to you. You are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. If we could hear that authentically, we wouldn't be all worried about stuff anymore. We want what people think of us. Uh, do I have enough money? Are people impressed? Do I, am I thin enough? Am I tall enough, and I got the right kind of hair, the right complex. If we could hear that, we wouldn't worry about all this stuff anymore. 
ask for it. Ask for it. I sat in that pew right back there. Nobody's in there now, but it's right at the break of the pew right there in 1995. And I was in a crisis. I sat there. And I just looked up. And the Heavenly Father came. And he showed himself to me. Brothers and sisters, I've never been the same. He said, I want you to know, I love you, and I got your back. <laughs> Somebody said to me, when we have holy hours on Friday, why do you sit way back there? Well, I said, first of all, it's near the confessional, but uh, could I want to hear. But the main reason I sit there is that's where I met him. Now, I mean, I met him, and I'd been baptized. I'd been to seminary. I did all that stuff. That's intellectual. But I met him sitting in that little corner pew right there. That's where I sat. And that's why I sit there during the holy hour. I'll never forget it. I pray the same for you. If God could do it for me, a stubborn, hard-headed sinner who's very intellectual, he can do it for you. He can do it for you. There is acknowledgement. You are my beloved son. You're my beloved daughter. If you will hear that, you'll never be the same. You'll be less anxious. Now, it took time for all that to work out in my life, but I'm here today because of his grace. I almost let go. I was right at the edge of a breakthrough, but didn't see it. The devil really had me, but Jesus came and grabbed me. And he held me close so I wouldn't let go. And he said, oh, come, come here. He held me and says, your father loves you. Don't worry anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Four gifts. We've done three of them. Access to the heart of the father. Anointing. Holy Spirit power. Likewise. Acknowledgement, you're my son, you're my daughter. Finally, not, approval, approval. I am well pleased in you. Now Jesus hears that from his father, and the, and the people standing by heard that. You say, well, how can I hear that? He can't be well pleased in me. I'm struggling, I'm sinning, I'm not I'm messing up. I'm... You know what, y'all? He knew that before he ever made you. Let me give you a $10 word, young people. Somebody say, leptic. Leptic. Okay. They said the word. <laughs> Define it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there's something in the scriptures that we call a proleptic. What, what it means is that there, there's frequently in the scriptures something that is not currently present, but will be one day. And so that sometimes God speaks to us knowing what will later be. For example, when he called Peter the rock... He was not a rock. He was at best a lot of shifting sand at the time. Amen? But Peter would become the rock after Pentecost. And God, the Lord always knew that about him. He always knew. God knows you in your perfected glory in heaven. He already knows you that way. And he's drawing you. If you will be faithful and listen to him, he already knows you in your heavenly perfection. And he has a name for you and for me. He hasn't revealed it yet to all of us. But God has in his, he, you know, I think he calls me Carlito. He does. But he hasn't revealed his, the, the name he'll call me by one day. But one day. Remember how he changed Abraham's name? Remember how he changed Paul's name? Remember how he changed Sarah's name? He changed Jacob's name? He knows you in your perfection already. You stay faithful to him, and he'll call you by that name. Right now, he says simply, I'm well pleased in you. you say, How could he be pleased? I messed up again. That's the devil, y'all. Satan, in Hebrew, the name Satan means accuser. You stay close to the Lord. He already knows you. St. Catherine of Siena heard the Father say this to her. Catherine, if you were ever to see a saint with me up here in glory... You'd fall down and worship because you'd think you were looking at me. If you are faithful, 
that is your future, and that is your dignity. I baptize you, says the Lord. I'm going to work a work in you. And when you're finished, when I'm finished with you, you're going to be perfect as the Heavenly Father's perfect. Not just humanly perfect. As the Heavenly Father. You, you will have a godly perfection, not just a human perfection. I've already got that one down. I mean, you know. <laughs> Somebody say, not. Okay. If I had that perfection, I could say one word and we'd be done, right? All right. All right. Brothers and sisters, it's the baptism of the Lord. The Lord says, listen, I'm not ashamed to call you my brethren. I know there's some nuts falling out of your family tree. I get that. But I love you, and I've come. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to identify myself with even the worst of sinners because I care about you that much. And I've come to give you access to my Father's heart again, which is really the heart of heaven. The heart of the Father is the heart of heaven. I've come to give you that access. I've come to give you the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I've come to allow you to let me acknowledge you as a beloved son or a daughter and to tell you this great gift that God the Father, I'm well pleased with you. I know you're still struggling, but I know you already in all your perfection. I know what you'll become. You just stay with me. Today is the baptism of the Lord got some gifts under our Christmas tree. It may, it's the final feast of Christmas. Got a few points that is left to remind us. Gifts under our Christmas tree at baptism. Wade in the water, children. Take me to the water to be baptized. Lord, I want these gifts. I need them. You've been good to me. I love you. You're my father. Thank you. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. I want the choir to come back up because you've got to sing a song for us. We're going to renew our baptismal vows now. So choir, come on up. And I want to renew our baptismal vows and then sprinkle the congregation. You're going to get a little wet. You're going to get wet because the Lord loves you. Don't just say, oh, my hairdo. Don't worry about your glasses. This is holy water. By the way, I want to tell you something about this water. It's not just any ordinary holy water. It's epiphany water. Sister, some of us gathered here uh, last Saturday, and we sang vespers and prayed over this holy water for over a half hour. It's high-octane holy water, okay? It had all the exorcisms read right over it, and the blessings came. We drove out the devil, and we brought the Lord. So this is not just any holy water. It's Epiphany water. And by the way, you might want to step under the... It'll be in the fonts for probably the next couple weeks. Take some home with you. It's high-octane holy water. Demons hate holy water. So if you get a little wet today, don't worry. If, if you're upset about it, don't worry. That's just the demon in you. <laughs> We're going to renew our baptismal vows. Please stand. Please stand. <clears throat> I think it's...